So a uh, lot of talk about how learning mechanisms can improve autonomy. Um, but uh, what happens when the sensor and the actuators that the reinforcement learning mechanisms are using are actually uh, attacked? And also, uh, what happens when they're not rational? Okay, so when we learn something, we always assume um, that all the agents will actually optimize some rewards and all, all of them will be rational. So I'll try to answer these questions. Okay, so of course, I mean, I don't want to give you the background of superphysical systems. I think we have it before. Um, as you can see, they're applied almost everywhere, and, um, and the U.S. government actually stated as a number one priority for, um, um, for funding, and uh, they said that our lives depend on them. So I don't know if it's true or not, but I think it's something there. Okay, so of course I will motivate um, the work that I will present to you. I will talk about how to design proactive and reactive defense for cyber-physical systems and then feed those back to a learning mechanism which is totally model-free and then also considers agents with different uh, rationality. Okay, so we all know this. So if, uh, this is I want to differentiate since last is coming between cyber-physical security and classical fault detection. Um, so cyber-physical security is mostly uh, worst-case attacks. Uh, it considers worst-case attacks. So, and uh, it needs a combination of different fields to approach the problem. Specifically, um, there is a need to develop things that um, combine a set of analysis and thesis, a synthesis from control theory, game theory, and optimization. I, I think we saw lots of talks on these things. Um, and then I found this to be a very interesting uh, uh, slide. Um, so the fourth industrial revolution is with the introduction of cyber physical systems. And, uh, but of course, things in cyber physical systems uh, will be more interesting if we add some intelligence. And what I mean by intelligence is when we add this fancy learning that everybody talks about. Okay, so as I said, before we apply the learning mechanisms, we want to secure what the learning mechanisms are receiving, okay? So we want to secure sensors and actuators. And uh, in order to do that, we want uh, to actually make it more uncertain for the attacker, okay? So we will apply something that is called uh, moving target defense. So in other words, this actually increases the surface of the attacker. So by actually switching randomly between different actuators and sensors, okay? So the learning mechanism eventually will use a different subset of actuator and sensors. Of course, we will assume redundancy, which is given in CPS, okay? And of course, since we're controls people, uh, we will find the, the controllable and observable sets, subsets, okay? And there are different things uh, in, uh, uh, in security, so people apply uh, classical network security, IT-centric security, and control theoretic security. But I want you to pay attention that uh, this proactive security that I told you about, which is the moving target defense, it's actually you're changing always the system, so to make it more uncertain. And there is also the reactive defense, which actually tells you what to do, okay? And uh, um, to, to the best of our knowledge, we're not familiar with any work that actually uh, control theory has uh, proactive dynamic uh, frameworks. Okay, so you can think that this is my um, uh, block diagram, okay? So you see that I have the plant, which can be anything, okay? So collects the sensors and the actuators. And then we have some um, data-based learning controllers, okay? So they're running in parallel. Uh, so whenever I detect something wrong is happening in the sensor actuator side, okay? So I switch to, uh, to a different subset of, actuators, of actuators and, and sensors. And I do that based on some uh, logic. Um, um, okay, that seems we don't have time. Okay, so we have some probabilistic switching logic, which actually comes from the moving target defense. So, um, and this uh, probabilistic switching logic um, depends on uh, the entropy, okay? So what better to introduce uncertainty when you can actually uh, solve a small optimization problem that actually optimizes the entropy, okay? And then, uh, as I said, we need some redundancy. And, okay, so, there are a few equations in this talk, but uh, they're simple, uh, simple to follow, okay? So this probability actually tells me which actuator I'm using, okay? 
And since I want to introduce this uh, uncertainty for the attacker, so he doesn't know at every time which I'm using to attack, so I do um, an optimization that actually uh, uh, has to do with this entropy that I told you about, okay? So of course, the probability of all the actuators has to be equal to one, okay? And then I, um, I find the best one and I switch it. And these JIs actually are the cost of, a, of every controller where they can be given by rewards, let's say, in a learning mechanism. Um, of course, the epsilon is the unpredictability, and um, the number n that you see there actually is um, the number of controllers, okay, the redundant sets. Okay. Um, so, and uh, because we want to be uh, model free, so what we will use, so we have actually uh, we have a patent that we found a model free formulation for the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman, which actually we call it integral reinforcement learning. And um, this actually is something like that. Um, so, it looks weird, okay? Um, so, what I want to do is I want to check this error, okay? And by solving that equal to zero, I actually solve the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation. Okay? But it's a model free. Okay? So as you see, there is no model there. Okay? Just measuring the state. And based on that, I found my reward. And then I compute. So somebody can ask, okay, what happens when you have a sensor noise? Uh, be patient. I will answer this pretty soon. Okay. So this is what I said. Okay? Um, so let's see how this proactive reactive works. So I measure this EI, okay, which is model free, okay, and uh, when I find that this is non-zero, so then they take this controller out of the queue, okay, and uh, I continue switch between different controllers, okay. So again, I I switch randomly between the controllers. When I find that something is compromised, I take it out of the queue, and then I continue switch to the other ones, okay. And of course, everything we, we have is uh, proven to have an asymptotically stable equilibrium point. I know for the controls people, we're, uh, this is very important, okay? And then we have applied that to a benchmark aircraft problem, uh, which is the admire, okay? So this has redundancy by design, okay? So we have an actuation degree of redundancy seven and a sensing degree of redundancy two. Okay, so these are the matrices. We don't really care about that. Uh, and of course, for those of you who are not aerospace engineers, so we get some redundancy by design, okay? So, so the canard or elevons, they provide the pitch moment, so you see the redundancy there. For all, the elevons will become the only active control surface and the rudder is used for all, for you. Okay, so here what you see is what I'm doing, I'm doing unpredictable switching, okay? So the attacker hasn't, hasn't yet attacked, okay? So, but I'm switching, you see the different controllers, this is the switching signal, and you see that eventually everything works pretty well. Again, this is not the attack scenario, okay? This is the attack-free scenario. Okay, and of course, since uh, I want to do optimality, okay, I always switch to the best controller, okay? Okay, and of course, I will evaluate what happens when I do switching, okay? So, Nothing comes for free. So unpredictability always has a price, right? Um, okay, so what we found is uh, what, uh, as you increase the weight on entropy, what is the optimality loss, okay? So in a learning mechanism, you can think, okay, what price you are paying? What fuel are you wa you're, you're wasting? What um, energy in general? Anything you can imagine that you can model in, an opt in a performance. Um, and also, um, as you expect, okay? So increasing weight of entropy, increase of unpredictable behavior, which is actually expected. Um, okay, so now, let's see that the attacker attacked, okay? So you remember, in the previous scenario, the, um, um, the, the most favorable controller was number four, okay? So let's say that the attacker was really smart, okay? But he, does, and he doesn't know that I'm using a, a moving target defense framework, though. But he knows that the best controller is number four, Okay, so of course, he or she will attack this number four. And then, as you see, okay, so it's, uh, we actually, um, the attacker attacks on number four, 
And then if I don't take it out of the queue, if I don't detect the attack and take it out of the queue, then my moving target defense mechanism actually again randomly chooses the, the, the actuator that the attacker took offline. Okay, so as you saw, uh, my, my, my system blows up. But of course, I, what I want to, to do is I want to take it out of the queue. So let's see how it works. So this is the proactive happens all the time, okay? And then after some time, you see in the switching that I don't use my number four anymore because I took it out of the queue, okay? But I still increased my uncertainty for the attacker. Okay, so of course now, I will answer also the other thing that I said about. So what happens when you have sensor noise? Okay, so of course this considers scenarios that the attacker uh, is introducing some Gaussian noise. Of course, we will have an upper known bound on that, right? We can't handle all the cases. And uh, so for example, we will know the statistics of the noise, okay? And um, so you see here, this is actually the model-free detection rule that I described to you before, okay? So you see that whenever, uh, of course, it's, we call it integral Bellman. So this is the blue, okay? So since I can guarantee that the attacker can do something worse than my noise, okay? So then I detect the attacks which happen from 10 to 20, and then I'm able to reconstruct my signal almost perfectly, I'll say, okay? Okay, so now, let me actually put it all this thing. Let me see, uh, since I secured my actuators and sensors, now I will put everything back into my learning mechanism. And uh, so of course, learning is the ability to learn something that you're not being programmed. And um, on, um, differently than um, people in, uh, that they do deep learning for um, uh, perception, what we do, we do feedback, okay? So with feedback, we can actually prove some beautiful properties that they come from uh, stability, robustness, optimality um, by following uh, control theoretic tools. Okay, so uh, what we use is we use actor critic structure mechanisms. So the actor actually is the controller, okay? And the critic actually uh, computes how good my controller is, okay? And it proves all the time. So as you see, the feedback nature is there, okay? So we don't require any offline training. Everything happens on the fly in a plug and play framework by just measuring the trajectories. Okay, so since we're controls people, although we don't care about the system because our approaches will be model free, uh, for a description, I'll provide you as just a, a linear system, okay? So we can have some cleaner um, description. And then um, we have different agents, okay? That every agent, let's say, is modeled by this system. Okay, so uh, the attacker in this learning uh, system can actually change my physical system by changing A, B, and D, okay? Can also change the actuator by manipulating VI, okay? And uh, what I control is UI, so the classical control input that we have in every control system. But again, we don't require any knowledge of this system. Um, so again, I will uh, actually, um, borrow some uh, formulations from non-classical Nash equilibrium formulation where you have a multi-agent system and then you penalize your own inputs, okay, but also the inputs in your neighborhood, okay? So in other words, I penalize how I receive information. And of course, since we have bad players into the system, so we will do a mini-max game for every performance that is distributed in every agent and I will do a non-zero sum game for all the agents. Okay, and uh, let's see how we can do that. So as I told you, everything before was model-based, model but now I want to define it in a model-free scenario. And I will borrow what is called Q-learning. Q-learning was primar primarily um, developed for uh, MDPs, and for, it's actually in other words, discrete time systems, and, uh, but for uh, continuous time systems, it's not easy to do because the Hamiltonian, let's say, that actually brings together the dynamics with the rewards contains the dynamics, okay? But in discrete time system, this is not true. So that's why people that they do Q-learning, they actually use discrete time system system. So we find a way to define the advantage function in, in the way that you see there. So the, the Q function, in other words, is a, a state and action dependent function, okay? And in other words, we want to find a way to, to compute this queue. 
And since we don't have time, uh, let me move a little bit, okay? So the classical approach is, is, of course, since we want to have the Q function, we will actually employ stationarity conditions, okay? So in other words, we will compute the best minimizing player and the worst maximizing player. And of course, this is the classic model base that people that are familiar with optimal control know. Okay, and of course, we want tuning clause for uh, my critic and my actor, okay? so. Uh, we will use gradient descent, and this will give us the classical plug-and-play uh, algorithms that we can just plug them in the, in the system, and the system will eventually solve this difficult optimization problem without requiring any knowledge about the system. And then, uh, again, I told you that, uh, but not all the learning agents are rational, okay? So, and then uh, I'm coming to, to the end of my talk. So again, so if we don't know anything about these two learning mechanisms and we have actuator attacks, so you'll see that my, my systems will blow and I won't be able to synchronize to what my leader tells me, okay? Um, but uh, if we employ our learning mechanisms, you will see that not only will I synchronize, but also I will be optimal. And then again, um, we can use other techniques from level K and cognitive hierarchy, okay, to get into more cognitive uh, science learning, where not all the agents are, uh, are rational and they share different, uh, let's say, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm smarter than this person, but he's smarter than me and uh, all these things, okay? So not all of the people know, ex have exact information about what is happening inside here, outside here, or all these things. So this boundary rationality actually captures these scenarios, okay? And in a cyber-physical system, this is very important because most of the cyber-physical systems, they actually being operated by humans or they have humans in the loop. And uh, so uh, there is a pretty good trick on how to model different levels of intelligence by using Poisson distributions. And um, in other words, we can uh, use these Poisson distributions in the computations of our actor um, um, and critic frameworks that I described before. And uh, since we don't have much time, so this is the final the algorithm that combines all the things that I told you about. And, um, and of course, let's say that in my multi-agent scenario, I had um, attackers of different levels, okay? Will my learning mechanism predict what type of intelligence every attacker has? Um, and then we were pretty successful in that by using this Poisson um, um, uh, modeling. And um, we had, let's say, two, four, 10, 15 attackers. And uh, we were actually be able to uh, model all of them in, in different levels of intelligence. And uh, of course, also the computations of the lambda parameter, they're happening online. So everything that I described here happens online in a plug and play framework. And then, I don't want to take more of your lunch time. So, uh, of course, there's lots to be done in this area, okay? Um, so, uh, I think securing the actuation and sensor that the learning mechanisms are using is very important. Of course, also using boundary rationality, where you don't model all the agents uh, with infinite intelligence because nobody's perfect. Um, Let's see what else. So there's different things that uh, need to be done. Um, how do you share public and private information? Uh, how about safety and adversarial learning? And uh, when you have a machine and the human that um, the machine is running learning, who do you trust more? Um, and of course, prediction, uh, using predictive learning for different scenarios for, let's say, to inform um, security analysts that their monitoring autonomous systems is also very important, so we're working on this topic.